Welcome back to Corbin AI, where I'm showing you daily how to start leveraging artificial intelligence in your personal and your business life. And in today's video, I'm going to go over fundamentals when it comes to prompt structuring in the specific context of automation softwares like Zapier and Make. As you see, we're going to be going over the three different models that are afforded to us. I'm going to give you use cases for every single one. I'm going to start off with struct the prompts not being structured correctly, and then we're going to structure them correctly together and learn why. We're going to learn a ton of stuff in this video. So if you do automation and you or you plan on doing automation, this is going to be a very fundamental video within your toolkit. Now, before we jump in completely, I want to go over some other use cases that I've shown when it comes to prompt structuring. So this is one of the recent videos I released this yesterday. If you're more curious on learning how to structure prompts for the front end, when you actually speak to chat GPT in the UI version, check out this video as I go over essentially how to create monetizable prompts. And I go over essentially how to create prompts that are specific for your use case and productivity. We're going to be going over today more specifically when we are structuring and prompting for the back end for automation softwares. Now, there is a reason why there is a differentiation when we structure prompts between the different models, as it seems inherently that it would, you know, if I use the same prompt in 3.5 on the front end, I could probably use that same prompt in Zapier, but that's just not true. The way we structure prompts, depending on how we access the API is going to be pretty different, which is a pretty interesting fact to know. Furthermore, if you're interested in learning all the different layers of prompt engineering and essentially every single subset of it when it comes to the front end, automation softwares, and then truly coding in the back end, I suggest you check out this video here as essentially this is going to give you context of the three different layers. Right now, we're at layer two. The third layer is actually talking to the API directly in code, and the way you structure those prompts is going to be different than how you structure them here. So... It's pretty interesting. It's good to know that essentially when prompt engineering, depending on the platform that you're communicating with the model, you got to communicate with it differently. So without further ado, let's stop delaying here. Let's jump into today's video. And essentially what I want to show you here is we have a trigger here, which is going to be a new customer email, which is not too important, but essentially the idea is this. We're going to use the data from this fake email, which essentially we're posing as a lawn mowing service. And this is a potential lead. And I'm going to show you essentially how each model could apply to this email. And then I'm going to essentially show you how to restructure these prompts to be more effective. So let's go to jump in. So just to start off, so you can get a broad overview of understanding what each model is in this toolbox here, think of the 3.5 as a formatting model. We receive a ton of data. Essentially, we want to find main points in the data. We want to reformat the data. We want to maybe make it bullet points. We want to maybe summarize it. This is the nature of the 3.5 model. 3.5 model 16K essentially can handle more data. So essentially, if you're dealing with pages of data, you would opt in for the 3.5 model to do the same thing that this model does, but just dealing with more input data that uh, for the underlying automation. And then finally, the ChatGPT4 model is for a more comprehensive task. Essentially, think of the ChatGPT4 model is the closest we have to human-like outputs. So therefore, we would use it for human-like activities like writing captions, writing articles, stuff of this nature. So essentially, what we have going on here is I'm going to show you three different prompts that are currently associated with these models. And as a... Uh, as a disclaimer, these prompts are not structured correctly. These are um, not optimized prompts. So the prompts you're about to see right now, I'm purposely making it so they're not optimized so we can optimize them together and you can intuitively understand what it means to make a good prompt when it comes to each one of these models. So the first model here we have essentially um, has this prompt here, right? So we got from this email I got, want to get some main points, provides the email and it says, I am interested in the street of the customer, size of their lawn, name, give me the exact values for each of these. So as you'll notice, right off the bat, we're using the 3.5 model because we're extracting data and we're extracting specific points of data found within this email. Now, if I jump back over this email, some of these points are like the name here, the streets, a uh, thousand square feet of mowing and, you know, phone number, stuff of this nature, right? So right off the bat, we need to understand, and obviously we got the model here, is one, this isn't structured correctly or as optimally as it could be structured. And the reason why it's important to structure your prompts correctly is that it relies on consistent outputs. You'll have consistent outputs. Therefore, we can get better outputs when we scale. So if this runs 20 times, out of that 20 times, we get 20 out of 20. Every time it gives an output, we get exactly what we want rather than maybe using this kind of prompt, which is very, it's not very lasered in to the point where ChatGPT could get a little too creative for us and we wouldn't necessarily want the prompt or the output. So knowing this, let's go ahead and understand one thing real quick before we dive into basically making this prompt a lot better. Um, essentially is the models, right? So we already have these models here, right? But what you'll see is some of these models have 0, 0314, 0, 0613. Um, I noticed they just added the turbo instruct. That's interesting. Uh, 0, 0613, uh, 0, 0301. 
these are essentially uh, dates that the model um, incurs. So what I mean by that essentially is that this is GPT-4 up to March 14th of 2023. Any updates or any different model changes that occurred past March 2014, sorry, March, March, the, the t March the 14th of March. I don't know why that was so hard for me to think of. Um, any model, any, like, so let's say there's an update in July. It wasn't incurred on this model. What you need to know as an automation uh, prompter is ignore these models. Don't use models with dates. You want to use models that just say GBT4, that just say GBT 3.5 Turbo, that just say GBT 3.5 Turbo 16K. And the reason I say that is because when, let's say you build out 20 automations and you're using GBT 0314, when they deprecate that model, essentially all those automations are not going to work because essentially this doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, use this one as this will always be there for you. Just think of it that way. So ignore the dates, go with the models without the dates. Mirror. Essentially, let's go ahead and reformat this prompt here so it is more effective and we'll go ahead and input some stuff here. Um, from here, essentially, what are we doing here? We say from this email I got, we want to get the main points. Let's go to give some context. So we want to start off by saying context. We received a lead for our company. I'm going to go ahead and make that right. We do the service of lawn mowing. Okay, so we've already fine-tuned the point where essentially ChatGPT understands, okay, we, we received the lead, and this is a lawn service, lawn service company. So we can go ahead and delete this. All right, and then we can go ahead and say, to make this specific, we're going to say, instead of email, we're going to say lead email. And then if you really want to, you know, go the extra mile here, what we can do here is essentially we can put uh, subject, semicolon, parentheses, and then uh, body. So then we have identified every single variable that's associated with this. Notice how essentially we say we received a lead or we received a lead email. I should put that here. And notice how we're calling upon that specific variable in that context here. We received a lead email, subject line. We're gonna go ahead and put in our subject here. And then we have our body plane. Just use that, we can load the data there. And then as you see here, the way we structure how we quote unquote want the output is I'm interested in the street of the customer, size of their lawn and name. Give me the exact values of each of these. Problem is, is that we're letting ChatGPT have too much um, discretion on how the output will look. So let's give it less discretion because essentially when we're grabbing data and we're specifically using it, there is certain, we want it formatted in a certain way. So we're, instead of using this kind of verbiage, I'm gonna go ahead and leave it down here so you can kind of see the difference. I'm gonna say generate the following main points. I'm gonna do semicolon here, and then we're gonna say uh, address. Or say street of, we'll say, instead we'll just say uh, customer, or we'll put lead, lead, phone number. Then we'll put uh, size of one, semicolon. And then finally, we'll go put name. And we'll put lead name as you may have your name in the footer um, or in some part of it. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And then notice this entire sentence goes bye bye. And essentially, now we should get an expected output of the three different variable points that we care about in this specific email, like this. So let's go ahead and proceed here GBT 3.5 Turbo. And any good prompt structuring, you're going to want to use a memory key. So we're going to say EM uh, 3.5. And essentially this ensures consistent outputs and we can kind of lock in our underlying output if we like how it looks. A lot of this other stuff I go over in other videos. So for now we can kind of ignore this. We're gonna hit continue here and we're gonna go ahead and test this step. All right, so as you see here, we got the lead phone number, we got the size of lawn and we got John Doe. So if we come back over to the email. All right, phone number, uh, John Doe, 1000, perfect. So essentially we got a nice little output here and essentially, if I keep saying essentially, um, if I went ahead and just command Z this, I guess I can't. I can't show you what the other output would have looked like, but it would have been very much more chaotic due to the fact that we didn't make it uh, fine-tuned. So we got email 3.5, that's locked in. So now every single time an email goes through this flow, we are now receiving a consistent output that looks like this. So now we intuitively understand using the 3.5 model block. Let's go ahead and jump over to 3.5 model 16K. So let's say we have a different context here. Let's say we're dealing with a ton of different emails. And essentially the reason we would use this alternatively to this is you know more data but what's great about this is what you need to understand is the way we format this is the same the way we format this so let's just say i'm going to copy this bring this over here 
paste it here, and then it can kind of come back over here. So notice, essentially, we're using the same prompt structuring, but the only noticeable difference between the two of these models is essentially just how much data we're feeding it. So how you model and how you prompt structure for 3.5 and 3.5 16K is the exact same in the context of automation. It's just how do you provide the underlying data? And what's great about this essentially is that, you know, in this context, this is all the same email, but assuming this wasn't the same email, then we provided three different emails here. If you wanted to call upon a specific email, you could really just go with the layman, or not layman, but just the dictation of email two is important because X, Y, Z. And what's great is that since you've identified email two and you've used the parentheses to cons uh, constrain the data, um, it will know that you're referring to email two here. So you can kind of call upon data points within a chat GPT prompt, especially when you're dealing with larger amounts of data, which may be important to you. Um, from here though, we can kind of jump over to chat GPT four model and proper structuring there. So we can go over to chat GPT four here, hit action here. And you know, this is not an optimized uh, prompt at all. But as you see here, we say, so we got an email from a lead. Here are some main points from the body of the email, main points, uh, email body and general response. We typically offer three plans. If the property is over 700 square feet, we include a free lawn and more. Notice how the way we structure in 3.5 is very um, uh, like strict. The way we structure in GPT-4 is gonna be strict as well. So that's kind of the way you gotta think about it. You don't wanna to talk to it lax. You don't wanna to talk to it as if you're having a conversation, which is ironic even though we're using the event of conversation, but you wanna to talk to it as if you're basically communicating with a machine or you are communicating with a machine, but in the sense of like, I give you a square peg, put it in the square square peg hole. I give you a circle peg, put it in the circle peg hole. Like be very, very specific in your language and how you use it. One other side note, one other caveat here is, um, let's say we're structuring out a prompt and we want a very specific output. And essentially, uh, by the time we receive that output, you know, our prompt is, we're using this much text essentially, right? You are better off and you're gonna have more consistent outputs, you're gonna spend less money, the less amount of words you use for your underlying output, the better it'll be. So it's not in the sense of like, oh my gosh, if I really wanna do something really complex here, I gotta just make paragraphs to really tell ChatGPT4 what I want. No, don't think like that. Think more in the sense of like, okay, so I have this paragraph here. How do I condense this? Okay, I don't need this word. I don't need this word. And you can kind of work away with it. The less words you use, the better the chat GBT prompt will be because the less words you use, there's less room for chat GBT to kind of think, uh, uh, misinterpret what you were trying to do originally. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that if you wanted to, you know, do one task, would you rather explain how to do that one task in a paragraph or a sentence and a bullet point? It's going to be the sentence of bullet point. So think of that when you're structuring, don't, don't write essays here. Um, let's go ahead and enter, let's go ahead and, reformat this and make this a lot better for GPT-4. So we got so we got an email from a lead here. What we do here is, and what we like to do here is essentially when we're dealing with prompt structuring, the first line in your prompt structuring should always be a context line. You wanna give um, the overarching plan and goal of the un underlying output. And that's gonna give you know GPT a good leg to stand on. Um, I don't know intuitively if this reads the text chronologically, I would assume so, but it does it really fast. As in like, does it read this and then this? I'm assuming it does. I don't know that exactly. Honestly, software works so fast. It's like milliseconds of how fast it works. But from what I've seen from my experience is that when you structure prompts chronologically, it leads to better outputs. So what does that mean? That means typically that you'll have context in the beginning, you'll have data in the middle, and then you'll have essentially your end, your last line will either be a format or a parameter or just how essentially what the output should look like or what you should generate. So keep that in mind when structuring these prompts. So I wouldn't want to do generate a response at top and the context at the bottom. Uh, from here though, we got context. We received a lead from our company. We do service of lawn mowing. And then essentially we can just kind of provide this. What you'll notice, um, the email. So what you'll notice is some of the structuring can be very similar between the two different uh, models. So you might be saying to yourself, well, didn't we kind of structure the 3.5 like this? We did, because the way we structure uh, the 3.5 prompts and the way we structure GPT-4 prompts can be very similar. And the reason it can be very similar is because of the fact that typically when ingesting data, 3.5 and 4, it can ingest data the same. 
But the reason we use different models is because we don't care about what we do care about, but essentially the, the ingestion of data, like if I eat a burger, it's going to be the same, but the output, maybe the burger wasn't a good analogy because we don't want that output, but the output essentially is the important part of essentially what we're going to change most likely. So, you know, for example, the generation part is the most pertinent part between why we even have a difference between 3.5 and 4 because what we're asking 3.5 to do relative to what we're asking 4 to do is going to be drastically different. So uh, we received an email from a company and we're going to go ahead and put a subject line here, uh, put a body here. And essentially, I'm going to delete all this because this is just not structured correctly. We can really get complex here. So I'm going to say this, generate a uh, subject line and email body responding to this lead email. And then I'm going to go ahead and put parentheses and put parameters. Uh, we offer three different packages. If the uh, lead has less than 2000 square feet of lawn, offer the price of 500 UCT. I'm not too sure, you know, obviously this can get more complex, but essentially I just wanted to show you the example here. So receive the lead email, provide the data, how we provide it. We got the same burger, but we're asking for very specific stuff. That's going to be more human like things, right? Responding to an email. That's going to be a very human like action. So I'm going to write the subject line, I'm going to write an email body, and then we'll give the parameters of we offer three different packages, give a little bit more context, essentially how we want to respond. Um, use GPT four here. I'm gonna say email uh, response. And then we're going to go ahead and hit continue here and test this step. One thing I want to point out as well is when you test steps and when you just work with GPT-4 as a model, it's going to take a lot longer for outputs comparative to the 3.5 model. All right. So as you see here, we got our relative subject line here in regards to the lawn mowing services we offer. And we got essentially the body of the underlying email. And, you know, one thing off the bat here um, is it might be a little too long here. And essentially the way we can kind of work around that is when you say parameters, we offer three different packages. Uh, I could add a format block here and say max of four sentences. You can get more uh, casual, a little bit more casual in the way you speak with GBT4. If you want to do a new response and you don't want to have pre-contextual data, add a one there, refresh the memory key. But you can get more casual in the way you talk to GBT4 uh, due to the fact that it's really, it's a lot smarter than people think. This, this model can do a lot of stuff that's very complex. Uh, come down here to the output and all right let's see there we go sometimes i'll do that and we'll show the actual output so here we go we got max of four sentences a lot shorter got our subject line um i don't want to get too complex here in the sense of essentially post this process is uh, formatting data and stuff like that but you can format data with a lot of zapier toolkits i suggest you check out our other videos here if you want to essentially know how to split the subject line and stuff of this nature but i want to show you one other use case that you can use the 3.5 model in um, and, and it is more conditional logic. So what I mean by this essentially is I say there is, um, we want to kind of make this a little bit more complex. So this is where it gets a little bit crazy, but you'll understand what I'm trying to do here. So essentially let's say, depending on a certain variable found in that email, we wanted to do conditionally a different thing. Therefore we would want to proctor the underlying chat GBT response a little bit differently. So what I mean by that essentially is that let's say we take a conversation here. And we're going to uh, sign in, I guess. I'm just going to ignore that. I don't know why I want to be signed in. I just duplicated the other block here. Um, I'm going to say conditional logic or just logic, not the wrapper. Okay. So uh, from here, essentially, we could just say this. All right. Generate. Yes. If the square footage of the line is over 500 and no if it if it is un, uh, under 500 square feet so this is going to refer to that underlying variable that we had in the email that was a thousand square feet as a lawn here we can use 3.5 in this context um and i might need to restructure this uh prompt, but we'll see. But we use 3.5 most of the time in this context. Essentially, we're just looking for a Boolean of yes or no, true or false um, in regards to what we're specifically looking for here. So as you see, we got a yes because the underlying square footage is over a thousand feet. So this is where it gets really cool. So because we added this logic block here, uh, we can add a filter block 
or not a filter block. We can add this pass block that I already added here and essentially make it really simple here. And we only go down path A if the reply of this logic is exactly matches yes. And essentially this will say, uh, this will go down this path and be like, good to go. But if the underlying individual has a lawn that is under 500 feet, we are going to get a response of no. Therefore, we're gonna say exactly matches no. We don't wanna go, we wanna go down this path if their lawn is smaller than 500. So we won't go down this path for the current email that we have because we have over 500. But look at this, we can drag this down here. And now we can take it one step further with our logic when it comes to ChatGBT. And now we know contextually that the email that we're receiving is going to be an email in this logic, um, essentially of a property that has a value or a square footage over 500. Therefore, the way we structured this underlying prompt can be a little bit more specific and we can use less words in the prompt because of the fact that contextually we know that we're dealing with a client or a lead that has over 500 square feet. That kind of includes this video here. Um, if you liked what you just saw there, make sure to leave a like for the value. It lets me know that you want more videos of this context. Um, if you want to learn more about automation and artificial intelligence, I'm going to leave a playlist at the end of this one where essentially I dive into all 5,000 apps found on Zapier's uh, backend and I show you how to leverage artificial intelligence with every single one. This video right here is probably one of the more powerful ones that I've done on this channel as now you know intuitively essentially how to prompt engineer every single type of block found on Zapier. One interesting concept and one interesting thing to know, as I said in the beginning of this video, is the way I talk to the front end of ChatGPT the way I talk to zap your version of ChatGPT or make version of ChatGPT, and the way I'm going to talk to the API when I actually code it out is gonna be a lot different. So now you understand how to use it in the front end. Now you understand how to use it in the automation platform. The final piece of cake here is gonna be understanding how to talk to it uh, as a direct open API call, which we'll learn. Don't worry about it. We'll get to that. Uh, but without further ado, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for tuning in. And yes, surprise, I'm an AI avatar Make sure to explore more here at Corbin AI, where we demystify AI for your personal and business life. Until next time.